thinks he can do a cop's job. Drop your weapon! Stay down! No one trusts a lone man in a while. Uh, well, let's get started because I have a lot of good questions for you. I want to start with Michael. Um, Joe Pickett does not appear to be embraced by his community. In fact, in the first episode, he's referred to as the lame warden over the radio, which is, you know, pretty personal if you're just trying to, you know, listen to the radio driving down the street there. Um, what's his relationship like as the game warden to the people in this town? What's his relationship like to the people? Yeah, you know, obviously it's it's not great after the first season. Can you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, what it's like at this point and how he's uh, how he's dealing with it and how he's working towards uh, perhaps uh, maybe being more liked or just uh, more respected? Yeah, I, to be honest, I don't think he focuses on that kind of thing, like how he's revered. He's someone that sees things in black and white, um, right or wrong. And then he, his moral compass, he just kind of sticks to that. And then whatever happens as a fallout is is always unfortunate, which adds to many fun events on the in the landscape of Joe Pickett. Joe tends yeah, to, right, to, I, to uh, organize their social calendar and events in the in the town with the people. So I'd say Mary Beth worries more about how Joe's being perceived than Joe does. I would say that as well. <laughs> I think that's right. And she seems a, a lot more concerned for her safety. There's a there's a good scene in, in last night's episode where she's, you know, saying something along the lines of, were you looking for trouble or did it find you? And uh, he doesn't seem to quite know the answer to that. Uh, so, Mary Beth, uh, I have a, another <laughs> question for you then in that. Or sorry, Mary Beth, Juliana, and you've already become Mary Beth in my eyes. Uh, it's last fun. season. We are one. You know, you're, one. you're just you're already protecting him right here on the on the call. Uh, so last season, your character, Mary Beth, Joe's wife, survived being shot while pregnant, but their baby did not. What sort of headspace is she in this season, especially as the season opens and we see that she's really, you know, uh, really clearly in that moment still? I think that the undercurrent of this season for Mary Beth and also for Joe is the is life after loss and how how a couple deals with grief and the kind of grief that you wouldn't wish upon anyone. So they're still very much in it. Neither of them has processed it fully because especially with a loss like a child, I think you never fully process it and it is with you all the time. So this, when we see, when we find Mary Beth and Joe, at the beginning of season two, there you find they are a year out from the events of that night where not only did they lose a child, but their one of their other children, Sheridan, was in grave danger, and Joe was in grave danger, and Mary Beth was in grave danger. And we see that they are on a path that is not fully aligned. And it's a couple that loves each other, but they're missing each other right now. And that's where we begin season two for Mary Beth and Joe. Yeah, I, I really liked that scene uh, again in last night's episode where you said, I, I miss you. And he kind of, he doesn't seem to get it. He says, I'm right here. Uh, and I thought that was a really good way to show that. Manifest is, is different for everyone. And it's, you, you're absolutely right in terms of um, how both of them are dealing with these events and then the great divide that ensues from that. Um, and then how your, your journey back as a couple, how you, how you do that. Um, and everyone does it differently and it's a tricky terrain to navigate. Um, 
which is uh, really interesting uh, themes to explore. Yeah, I think it's what's really uh, compelling to me about it while watching is that part feels very real that, you know, the idea of having to, to deal with, a, you know, maybe a miscarriage, for instance, but putting it in a more dramatic situation uh, feels like something as watching as the audience like, oh, that seems that alone is uh, dramatic enough. And then on top of it, you have what what uh, what Joe is dealing with uh, as the season progresses. So uh, I actually want to talk about uh, that. We have a clip, Michael, as Joe and Mary Beth are coping with the loss. Something else is going on in the town. And uh, I want to take a look at that. Okay. Joe? That might be a situation. Hi, honey. Hi, Mama. Uh huh. Blair's husband, Frank, went hunting up over Swanson Lake with his nephews. They were supposed to come home last night, but his nephews called this morning to say they got separated on the mountain and nobody's heard from Frank since. Uh, up on Swanson Lake. Why is that bad? Uh, there's been some weird reports this season. Um, they call it Bermuda Mountain, like Bermuda Triangle. There's no GPS service, and there's a strong magnetic pole that scrambles compasses. It would be really easy to get lost if you didn't know the area. Have you told the sheriff yet? No. No, Frank wouldn't love that. It, I swear that man would rather die alone in the woods than have me embarrass him by sending the sheriff out looking for him. Could you go, Joe? Could you go look for him? Yeah, of course. Michael, if there's something strange in your neighborhood, uh, why is this a job for not the Ghostbusters or the sheriff, but Joe Pickett? Why is this something that, that Joe is taking on? Because at the, in the nighttime, uh, in the wee hours, he becomes the Ghostbusters. So it's kind of like his alias. It's like Joe Pickett is the Ghostbusters. And then at night, he goes out it's like Scooby-Doo. Do you know what I mean? He pulls out <laughs> yeah, the yeah. back of the ass. We call it a magic finder. And he's like, what's happening here? Something's happening. It's me. I'm coming out of here. Um, and because whenever there's a situation, uh, Joe Pickett will go out and, and have a look. You know, he'll have a sniff around. Yeah, I like that. I like that. That's a you got some more of Paramount Plus spinoff material is uh, the other Joe's other life. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they're listening. Uh, okay, while well, while well, uh, while Michael works on a future Ghostbuster spinoff, uh, Juliana, uh, Mary Beth, and Joe's three daughters are having trouble at school. Uh, you know, of course, we see uh, there's actual wild animals in the cafeteria, but other than that, what's going on with them, and and how are your characters supporting them? With the kids at home, yes. well, we the the girls are in a major transition phase because, of course, they're also dealing with their own experience surrounding the loss of their baby brother, their unborn baby brother. But now we have a new child in the house with us, April, who has become their sister and is a part of our family. So, you know, when any new sibling enters the mix, a baby or otherwise, there are challenges with the, the kids who are in the house. So while they love each other and they're excited to have her there's also conflict because it's three little girls sharing a bathroom you know three little girls navigating siblinghood in a completely new way with a totally new dynamic and then you've got Sheridan who is trying to wrap her head around the fact that she feels completely responsible for what happened that night regardless of the fact that she's a child and had no responsibility in it. And then you've got April who is coping with essentially being orphaned and abandoned, not orphaned. Of course, her mother is still, still alive, but abandoned and her father has died. So she's in a new house in a, with new parents. And it is a really complicated time for these girls, but the best part about the show really for me is the levity and the life that they bring to the Pickett family. And I love, love in the season watching their dynamic with Sharon Lawrence, who plays Missy, and just how much joy and humor that relationship brings to the show. Yeah, I love that. I, I uh, myself have three older sisters, so that that by itself is already, that's a, really? that's a lot really? to deal with. Yeah, just in a just in regular life, that's in the best way. It's great, but that's a lot of uh, you know, that's, there's a lot to to deal with, including sharing a bathroom. When you said that, that really, 
that really struck home with me. <laughs> uh, so, Joe, I, I want to talk to you, uh, Michael, about Joe's, you know, feelings about all this, too. We, we see a little bit of him interacting with the kids. Where there's, there's that one scene I already referenced where uh, they're so excited for their dad to sort of save the day. Uh, and it's actually a really funny scene how they get the uh, the 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 um, is it a moose or deer? I, I wish I knew out of the uh, cafeteria. Yes. And uh, yeah. So go ahead. <laughs> I so said, does he save the day? Well, I don't know. He, do, I mean, she wants him to. So I guess that's what I'm saying. Like that, that's that. She's watching and she's going, "Hey." <laughs> she said, "My dad's a Ghostbuster." So yeah. Yeah, he is. Yeah, it's funny, and 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 uh, Joe has this new um, offsider, um, played by uh, Kian Johnson and uh, Luke. And Luke is kind of like, doesn't really want to be there, doesn't really want to be a game warden, but he's given it his best. Um, he's like the comic relief. Um, and so he's in there trying to help the situation in that scene that you're talking about. Very funny. Yeah, so, tell me a little bit more about Luke. He's kind of, it's almost a Batman and Robin situation, if I can do yet another metaphor here, where he's kind of the, a little bit, as you said, comic relief. Uh, you won't yeah. let him sit in the front. That's for the dog. <laughs> That's exactly right. You know, Joe's the old grumpy, uh, you know, uh, old hat. And Kian is the young, new, sprightly, uh, talkative uh, offsider. Um, it's actually a really fun dynamic. Between, the two of us had a lot of fun shooting all the scenes that we got to shoot. Um, Kian brings a lot of energy and a lot of excitement. And um yeah, it's fun to watch. I think you'll have fun watching those scenes between the two of them. I, I know I did when I watched them back. Uh, a lot of laughs. I, I think, uh, funnily enough, there's the humor there, but then also in, in, in moments, it's almost like a there's, it's almost a horror film, a horror show, uh, and it's it's very scary in that way and very uh, uh, compelling, for lack of a better phrase. I know I keep saying that, but I was compelled. Uh, when Joe goes searching the forest for Frank, he's warned that the forest is haunted by a, a Wendigo, an evil spirit. And we actually have a clip of that, uh, what what or who that might be. So let's take a look. Okay, great. Nice catch. How many you got there? Legal limit six. Lost count. Maybe ten. That's a violation. I'm gonna need to see your license. I ain't got it on me. Might be in my bag. You mind if I take a look? That a yes? Yep. While you look, I'm gonna keep fishing. Sit yourself. Come again? I said I'm willing to let this go. You just turn your horse around. Drive back to where you came. Because if you start messing with me, well. Well, what? Well, it may not turn out too good. Are you threatening me? Michael, what is this? mysterious man whispering under his breath and does he want joe to hear it he doesn't want joe to hear it but uh, uh, from what i can uh, gather and from the clip david um but it sounds like he's saying careful what you wish for uh ominous i would say um it makes me want to watch and see what happens what's he gonna do what's gonna happen to joe there who is this guy um, the, the next frame that we did miss is the reveal of just the stature of this individual played by Alex. Um, he, is, he is one of the Grimm brothers uh, who you'll come to know throughout the, this, this second run. Um, he's, he's what is that? He's fantastic. He is Alex. fantastic. Yeah, he really is. Yeah, he brings a great character to life, or you'll see. Yeah, yeah you'll see. Yeah. You, you teased it up pretty well. I, I don't know. Spoilers, Michael. <laughs> yeah. Too many, I don't know how much. Nuggets. <laughs> I think too much. 
I would say he's twice as good as you might expect. Let's maybe we can oh, we can leave it there. Oh, yeah, good. nailed he it. Is. Yeah, he is. He's twice the size. He's twice as good. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I do. I do like. There's a moment without any spoilers where uh, you're kind of like, oh, that you know, the, the brothers Grimm. No, <laughs> we don't. Not that title. <laughs> so I, I do. I appreciate the sort of tongue in cheek, and we're not gonna we're not gonna be quite on the nose there. So that was really good. Uh, so we have this happening with uh, someone who is you know taking the heads off a of fish with his mouth and, and much more. But on the other uh, track here, Juliana, Mary Beth. Um, is kind of noticing some other things happening in town, and she does have this legal background. How will she put that to use this season? Ooh. Well, David, first I have to say I have been, I've promised my daughter, Mabel, that I will tell okay. people that my name is Juliana. She has made me Oh, promise. my gosh. Of course. So, Juliana Gwill. Juliana. Yes. You well got done. it. Okay. So she, I, yes. I say, it's a new thing for me to say it, and she made me promise. So here I am saying it. I'm so glad you did. I don't want to repeat it incorrectly a hundred times. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> so yeah. Mary Beth, I mean, Mary Beth is very good at connecting the dots. She mm -hmm. has a knack for seeing what's going on in pe people's outer and inner worlds and using that to draw conclusions about what's happening. So when she when she dives into something, she's relentless. She just will not rest till she gets to the bottom of it. And ultimately that's what we see happen in this season is she comes across a person who is also grieving and wants to help. And this is an interesting thing for her because as we see in the first couple episodes while she is very well intentioned it doesn't always translate that way and so she has to navigate her own experience of trying to cope with her grief by helping someone else and and realizing that's not necessarily going to work it's not that simple and what does that mean for her moving forward in this in this storyline and without giving anything away, which is quite tricky to do and to talk about it. She she and Joe ultimately unite forces and and go down the path together to solving these more the the things that are happening in the season. things that happen. Things that occur. <laughs> yeah. It's the external think it's okay. events that sort of start to bring them back together, draw them back. It's it's so bizarre how they can't just sit and talk about it because Joe can't name those feelings um but the external factor of the show is what slowly brings them back together as a team it's really yeah it's beautiful i love it and and there's a there's another character i'm curious about if we're gonna see him again uh last season joe put the man who trained him in jail and so i, I maybe as much as you can briefly tell me about Vern dunnigan and how he shows up this season Vern dunnigan so yeah Vern dunnigan was uh, imprisoned at the end of the first season. Uh, and this season, does he come back? <laughs> Do you know, I, I, haven't, I haven't watched that far yet. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if he is. Does he come back? I think you, that those who love David Allen Greer will should be. Watch. They should watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we have two of those people who love David Allen Greer. We yes, love big, David Allen big Greer. Big for the drag. Yeah, yeah, the drag. These are good teasers, and you know, if he dies or anyone that else dies, they'll be in the Ghostbusters spinoff. So it's a win-win for everyone. So yeah, it's already yeah. in the works. At Not plus. They're calling me right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh. They called, oh, they called me on the slipper phone. Oh, uh, good. Yeah, why? Uh, they always get me on the slipper phone. I haven't seen a phone that big for a while. Uh, I have a lot of questions about your your different phones, but well, uh, while you're on the phone with Paramount Plus, we have an audience question from Carissa in Pennsylvania, and she asks, "Were the the pickets were traumatized in season one? How will that impact how giving of themselves they are, who they trust, and how willing willing they are to get involved?" Uh, we'll start with you, Juliana. That's such a great question. Hello, great Carissa. Question. Hi, Carissa. First of all, thanks for, thanks for watching. 
Yes. Gosh, that is so insightful. Of course, their trauma is going to impact how they move through the world. And for Mary Beth, her world got smaller. And what she, who she's interacting with, who she is sharing with, how is she, how she is speaking her grief out loud has been very contained. And so in season two, we, we meet her at a moment where she's just starting to dip her toe in to letting the outside world in again. I think that's, that's the best I can say about that in terms of how, how she's willing to open herself up at this point. She's, she's not, and it takes, it takes a moment for her to get there. Michael, same question. Same question. Yes. Great question, Carissa, and thanks for watching. Um, I would say that, and we've spoken briefly about this. I would say that, for, uh, for Joe, it has created, it's like a lump in his throat or like a stone in a rock in his stomach that won't move. And he doesn't want to talk about it and he can't talk about it. So he ignores it. And that in itself creates a divide with him and his, his favorite person in his world, his wife. So now there's like a, a divide between them and uh, we're gonna see how, how they get that connection back um, post-trauma. Okay. okay, we have so many little, we just planted so many nuggets, teasers to get ready for throughout the season. So I'm excited for that. Uh, I wonder if any, if the, the books that this is a, these are adapted from could give any clues to any of the the viewers. Have either of you uh, read the books that uh, were, you know, that are inspiration for the TV show? I haven't read them. You have There's... read a few of them, Michael. <laughs> I've read I've read a few of them, but I haven't read all of them. There is so many. Um, the, you know who has yeah. my mother? Yes, <laughs> she's read and... them all. Oh yeah. Wow. She's read okay. them all. She read, she read them all immediately. And so we really should get her on here. But uh, yeah. Mr. Bob, we... DJ Bob, has written some incredible, incredible oh, books. And that's, that's, that is why we are here. Oh, yeah. Did you, are you calling my mom? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got her on the shoe. Yeah. yeah that's, why we're, that's why we're here. And I think that absolutely they can give some insight to what happens in the first season and the second season and hopefully all the seasons moving forward. I think the really wonderful thing about our writer's room and our creators, the Dowdles, John Eric Dowdle and Drew Dowdle, is that they have incorporated and stayed very, very true to the tone of of the novels and these and the titular character and the nuclear family. And then also pulled from the experiences of our writers in the room to really build out this show. But yeah, if you if you get into those books, you're gonna you're going to get some insight for sure. They're okay. a lot of fun. Right. Books really are a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, the, the ones that I've read are a good read. I ended up not reading too much because I didn't want to be too influenced by the character of Joe in the novels. And I wanted to try and find, you know, uh, our own Joe. Um, but, you know, now that we've done that, maybe I should go back and read the rest of them. What do you think, CJ? <laughs> I think I think I think uh, whatever you're doing is working for the show. So it maybe whatever the right balance is to to keep that character on balance is good because I don't want you to be thrown off by uh, what you're doing, what your performance on the show. And yeah. uh, with, <laughs> but I do have a question sort of related to that, and probably a question you've gotten a few times, but I have to ask anyway. I you know I was shocked after consuming the show that uh, to see that you are from New Zealand, and it's very clear to me now. Uh, you know, that, that unless you're putting on a different accent, but uh, how are you finding this accent for, you know, this, this person in Wyoming? How are you, or is that just something that came natural or is that just uh, something you had to work on? Uh, no, I definitely had to work on it. Um, I was going to say that I, I picked it up at the 7-Eleven. Um, it was half price <laughs> when I bought it. So you get what you get. Um, you don't get upset. Uh, no, I had to, I got a dialect coach, always use a dialect coach. Um, uh, I find it a real challenge to be honest. So definitely not the best at doing accents. 
That is not I, well, true. I, Sorry, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> no, it, it takes me ages. It does. Yeah, it really and I know does. you find it challenging because it's really challenging, but you're, you're excellent at the accent so good and that I mean that's what David's saying you know it is it is very surprising when you hear Joe and then you hear Michael absolutely it's very surprising of course he is just putting on this New Zealand accent now and that's a bit confusing right, too. Of course. He's actually uh he's Parisian so Michael let's hear it <laughs> if you could see like the, you know like how long it takes me to do that stuff you, you would laugh it's it's it is it, it is humorous um some of the things I just can't say. Them. Oh, it takes me ages. It's great. The funniest, the best part is when you, you know, if there's dialogue changes on the day, and you know, someone will say, "Oh, can we try this or try that?" And if you don't have a coach with you to help you through that, that's always fun. That's uh, why I'm there. You, you have maybe twenty coaches, or you just have Jules. The greatest thing was Jules. I'd be like, Jules, can you just say that once before we do a take? Can you say that for me? She'd say the word a couple of times, and then we'd give it a we'd give it a red hot go. I love that. I well, now I'm curious if the coach isn't there. It's it's Juliana, but also you mentioned Seven Eleven. Is there like a is there a, do you have a favorite clerk that you go to and imitate that guy, or is there is there a person in your life? It's closest. I'll I'll take the act the whatever accent is cheapest at the time because they sell accents there. So you know, and they also sell sleep if you're tired. You know. It's oh great. my god. I use it a lot. You know, <laughs> it all goes into the show. A lot of preparation. <laughs> uh, what what other what other preparation have you all had to do for the show? I mean, obviously there's some horseback riding. Is is that something you, you're familiar with, Mike, or doing before Michael, or was that that was new too? I am not. For, a, that's impressive. Not a, um, it's yeah. That, that was the we we get a little bit of training. Um, the Wranglers do a great job. Uh, they take us out as much as time allows. Um, but whenever I am on a horse, uh, they're always around to make sure that that I'm safe. Um, there's some interesting sequences in this season, which really scared me. I was. I was uh, exhilarated. It was exhilarating. I was so frightened that I may have had to change uh, my pants a couple of times. Uh, but I did come you out. With, safe. You were work. always safe with our team. We had the, that team kept you very safe. Yeah. They <laughs> did keep me safe. It's just that I'm not. I I'm just not used to how wonderful and powerful horses are. You know, like it's yeah. awesome. right. When you're right. on the when you're on the back of a horse and it's doing what it does, amazing, you know. But it still has its own mind, you know. I love it. I I uh, there's a, there's a particular sequence which we won't give it away. Uh, but I really appreciate it. I think from the right maybe the end of the first episode. So maybe that's up for. But you know, it's a great it's a great <laughs> sequence if you haven't seen it on the Correct. horse. And it's uh yeah. Uh, okay, so we have time for one more question here for for Juliana. Do you, what kind of prep are you doing for this show? I'm kind of curious. Is there what kind of uh, what what mindset are you putting yourself into before getting to the character of Mary Beth? Well, the wonderful thing about this role for me is that it is it's very close to my heart and very close to me. And Mary Beth is is a mother. Uh, I am a mother of two of two little cuties and I draw a lot on that especially for this season because ultimately at the heart of this this family and at the heart of what Joe and Mary Beth strive for is the safety and the of their of their children and that was they were really shook last season so that was a huge driving force for me coming into season two is how, how do we never let this happen again? And I think we both carry that through in what I've seen of this season and what I felt while we were shooting it. And then in terms of on the ground training, we get to do so many fun things in season one. I did, I did also do some work with the horses, which was very, very fun and made me, it brought me back to my North Carolina roots and getting on horses when I was little. That was really great. And then this season we did some arms training. Michael, of course, has done a, a lot of that. 
with Pickett. And then uh, to speak to to other characters in the show, Nate Romanowski, Mustafa's character, he uh, works with hawks and or falcons, sorry, falcons, and um, also did a lot of arms training and bow and arrow training. So there's there's some fun stuff that happens on the show for oh, and Sharon this season, she's she's in the in the bar singing, which is I mean if you know anything about Sharon Lawrence and 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 where she comes from, her background is musical theater and she just has killer pipes and an incredible stage presence and I was so excited to see how much that's being utilized. But we all got to do a few fun extras. Yeah, absolutely. It's it you don't even have to, you know, go out and uh get licensed for sound. You already have her as your soundtrack. It's great. It works really well. Uh, and I think all of that kind of is a perfect, uh, wraps it all really up nicely where there's just this whole world building that's happening with this show and it's, it's really fun to watch. So thank you both. But unfortunately we are out of time for today. So Michael Dorman, Juliana Gwill, thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Nice to meet you, David. Thanks for having us, Washington Post. And thanks everyone for watching. We we really appreciate it. Thanks guys. Appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for tuning in today. To check out what interviews we have coming up, head to WashingtonPostLive.com to find more. I'm Dave Jorgensen, and thank you for joining us at Washington Post Live.